It's time to take your business to the next level, the boss level. These are the premier business owner strategies and successes being utilized by the industry's top talent today. Rock your business like a boss, a VO boss. Now let's welcome your host, Anne Ganguza. Hey everyone, welcome to the VO Boss Podcast. I'm your host, Ann Ganguza, along with my very favorite audio engineer, Mr. Tim Tibbetts. Hey Tim, how are you? Hey Ann, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. You know, Tim, last uh, last podcast, we talked about normalization and there were two different normalizations. We talked about peak and RMS normalization. And I remember we were talking about RMS was used in audiobooks. So what do you think about talking about audiobook production and how that how people can fine tune their audio to make their audiobooks sound amazing? Well, I'll try. I mean, uh, I don't know if people out there know, but when Ann and I meet, it's completely unscripted. Yes. Uh, so we just kind of wing it. And uh, RMS normalization sounds like a good place to start. So um, I, I think I made it pretty clear when we were talking about normalization that peak normalization takes the loudest part of your signal, amps it up or, or brings it down and either amps up the audio or brings down the audio by that same amount. Right. So it uses right. the largest. the uh, the loudest peak as the baseline. Now, an RMS normalization, which again stands for root mean squared, which is a fancy way of saying averaging, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're averaging the loudness of the audio, that's what RMS normalization does, is it takes the quieter parts and makes them louder, and it makes the louder parts and makes them quieter, but then you normalize it to minus three after that. After that, you do actually do peak normalization, right? To uh-huh. make sure that it's brought up. Yeah, to minus oh, I'm glad three you brought dB. that up. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, why, yeah. again, do we do RMS for audiobooks? Well, the reason we do RMS for audiobooks, and, and by the way, we don't always need to do RMS for audiobooks. There is a way to go about getting the levels that you need to get by using a uh, light compression and doing it a few times until you get where you need to be. Okay, mm-hmm. so I just want to make that clear. Other people are using limiting in order to get there. Mm-hmm. I don't like limiting because without getting too scientific about it, it sucks out the dynamic range and it cuts off the top of the waveforms. And anyone out there who has recorded a waveform and then limited, you'll know exactly oh, yeah. what I'm talking about. Yep, I- okay? <laughs> yeah, and, and, that, and that is fine. For even some commercial or promo stuff, like if you're doing longer narration and after you're done normalizing, you have a few, you know, peaks that are just kind of sitting out there on their right. own, but, but they're just a few, right? So when you right. nip off the tops, exactly. when they do come along, when you're saying one word, no one's going to notice, but they certainly will notice if you limit too much and the entire thing is just one continuous volume across the entire file. And it just sounds like this and. <laughs> You know, no, nobody <laughs> wants that because the dynamics are gone, right? So, but but here's the thing about getting an RMS number between minus 18 and minus 23, which is ACX requirement plus then normalized to minus 3 dB mm-hmm. is because a lot of people are listening to podcasts in their car, on their phone, and so on. And no one wants someone constantly reaching for their volume knob because they can't hear something. Right. Right. So averaging out the audio is actually a smart thing to do. It's it's the right thing to do when it comes to something like an audiobook. Well, I'm going to say in in a contrast in terms of when I when I'm recording narration, if I have a high peak, I tend to want to like just take that peak and kind of deamplify it a little bit so that when I do mm-hmm. my normalization, it's not completely, you know, whacked out for that one high peak that I have. But for audiobooks, I I hear what you're saying to have more of it normalized or excuse me, more of it normalized so that you can hear in case there's other extraneous noises. I think that's I think that's great. But there's so many different yeah. ways to do this. What do you suggest? I mean, is it just an RMS or I've known people that have used different tools that have helped you uh to kind of normalize your audio that way. And I don't know like what the effectiveness of that is. I mean, sometimes I listen, I mean, I've used the tools myself back in the day and I'd listen to it afterwards and it just didn't sound right. Yeah. So without calling out any names, there is a tool out there that kind of gets your, your, your loudness where it needs to be automatically but you don't see it happen, right? Mm. You just throw it through this plug right, in right, exactly. and it's, yeah. And it spits it out the other side. Right. And, and when there's you no com- control. There's no control. Right, and there's it. no control. Exactly. So when you're, when you're taking care of your RMS levels 
inside of whatever you're using, whether it's Audacity or, you know, what, whatever DAW you might be using. The simple fact is, is that when you are using responsible compression in order to take care of those peaks that you talked about, right, right, and you're bringing those down, and this has to do with some terminology that I realize is going to confuse some people, but what we're really looking for here is to normalize the audio to minus 3 dB first, and then use this compression with a threshold that's set a little bit below that peak. So that when it compresses, uh, right. it right, it's only hitting those peaks. Right. And we set and we set what's called the attack time, which is how quickly that compressor begins to act. Mm-hmm. We set it to zero. So it sort of acts like a limiter, but at the same time, not because it doesn't just cut off the top of the dynamic range. So when you do it correctly and you're still meeting those minus 18 to minus 23 numbers, and then you use this plugin that we were talking about earlier. I don't know if you'd call it a plugin as much as a tool. But regardless, when you run it through this, this uh, leveling plugin, and then you listen to doing it the way that we talked about earlier, which is just a series of compression until you reach your numbers versus listening to it thrown through that tool, mm-hmm. it's not even close. Mm, yeah. A- after having thrown it through the tool, it does not sound natural. It sounds as if it's being over pushed. Mm-hmm, the signal mm-hmm. is being over pushed, for lack of a better way to put it. And it's just not preferred. So even if it's not audiobooks that we're having a discussion about, and let's say it's longer form narration, right, which you right. and I have both done, right? Mm-hmm. E-learning, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And you see those few stray peaks, then yeah, you know, you could limit that. But still, and I'll get with you and we'll put in like a little compress- compression plugin to get you in a better spot so that you can just hit that one button. Oh, nice. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then run with it, right? Okay. And not have to worry about it sounding as though it's being uh you know just overly pushed through right the right signal. so yeah. it sounds to me then like what you're saying is let's become better engineers rather than depending on a tool to just process your audio especially like for me it was always uncomfortable because i couldn't control anything or even see what it was doing. So like I said, I think even as a professional, you know, there are these times when I'll be recording and I'll have a peak that's way up there. And I, (laughs) you know, uh, that's probably not optimal. So I think we can maybe become better engineers then before we just trust in running it through a tool that may or may not do what we want. That's correct. You these days you have to educate yourself. Yeah. You just simply have to. We're getting stuff that is being kicked back because they're not meeting the numbers, because Mm -hmm. it's too sibilant, because you can hear the room too Mm -hmm. much. You know, Mm -hmm. the it used to be that audiobooks were basically the golden standard because that's essentially where voiceover from home started, you know, in quotes, voiceover from home. People reading books in open rooms. And hey, back then, you know, not a big deal. You're listening to a story just like you would, and someone would be reading that story to you in a room Mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. then audiobooks and the expectations for audiobooks increased dramatically right and what we started seeing is talent actually going to studios and voicing inside an amazing studio and the audio sounding incredible Mm -hmm. and so that turned into okay well let's have some people who can voice these audiobooks because there are too many of them and we don't have enough studios. Let's say that that was the math. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so now we start having these so-called home studios where people are in closets or they're in booths, whatever the case may be, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is they're being told to do certain things that they shouldn't necessarily be doing. Mm -hmm. All right. A good example of that would be if I were to get the mic away from me like this, because this is, this is often how people are told to Where'd read. You go, and I, and, Tim, exactly, where'd you go, Tim? Tim, where did you go? <laughs> exactly. You can, you can, <laughs> so I'm hanging where'd that this bass, away. Where'd that beautiful bass sound? <laughs> Tim, <laughs> Tim, it's go. <laughs> well, I, I'm actually voicing around hang loose away and it's pointed oh, down. Really? Towards, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's pointed down towards me, kind of towards my forehead. And then of course, when I put my head down like this, or even if I'm looking straight forward and I'm reading my copy, we're now hearing the entire room. Yeah. And that's not, you know, a lot a lot of people will say, well, it's fine with audiobooks if you hear the room. But in reality, you have a lot of audiobook narrators now who are in these amazing booths. Sure. And their sound is great. And they're getting more jobs than people who aren't 
implementing the same thing. Oh, yeah. These people do understand how to correctly handle their audio after the fact. And also, when they're sending in their audition, the difference between someone who sounds acoustically good, who sounds sonically good, and obviously who can read, right? That's Mm. a big part of, but all things being equal, if you have someone coming in like this, nice and clean, it sounds real good. Oh, it makes a huge difference. Right, versus this, and the author or whoever is listening, then you know. It raises the standard. It raises the bar. Yeah, it raises the standard, yeah. It really raises the bar. Yeah, and so a noise floor of minus 60 I, I, I'm not sure if that's still the requirement. I'm pretty sure it is for ACX. But over the years, commercial and promo have blown those, no, those noise floors away, mm-hmm. okay? Because promo and commercial people, they're serious, man. Oh, right, <laughs> I mean, yeah. They, they go for it, right? <laughs> and so these people are spending unbelievable amounts of money. Of course. In order to get, yeah, in order to get themselves Absolutely. situated in great booths and all that. And their noise floors are just absolutely in the tank. I mean, and, I've yeah, I've seen sittings, I've seen sitting noise floors at minus seventy two, and then by the time we're done processing it, and you know, using noise removal responsibly again, I've seen noise floors, you know, going down to like minus eighty five, minus ninety. Well, just I think ridiculously, yeah. Low. And I think that the the bar really has been raised. And and in and in one way, if you know, I mean, if you want to think, is there anything that can come out that's really good about this craziness of the pandemic? Is that we've had to up our studios, and that in effect, if you have the better sound, the better audio coming out of your studio, the more chance that you're going to get the gig, and the less that you know, all of these thousands of people that think that voiceover is easy and they can simply record an audio book, you know, from their living room, um, you know, it really, I think, it lessens that that crowd from from actually, you know, being any type of competition. So yeah, it's it good really for does. us as a community, as an as an industry, that we are having to up our game because that just separates us from. Yeah, you know, it does. It does, and. Why wouldn't you use the tools that are available to us now that mm-hmm. just a few short years ago weren't even a thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, like the like the Apollo that you're speaking through right, right. now, right? Compared to oh my what gosh, we yes. used to have you on. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? I'm I'm all I'm all about it. Like, why didn't I do this years ago? Uh, right. <laughs> so right. I, well, I mean, it, it may have been that it wasn't available years yep. ago. But mm-hmm. one thing that was available years ago was the type of booth that you have now. Yes, right. Absolutely. So I think that you can speak directly with considering all of the medical narration, the IVR that you've done. I, I suppose we should explain what IVR is: interactive voice uh, recognition, r- recognition, or mm-hmm. recording. Yeah, whatever. Yep, it is. recording. Yep. Um, and the e-learning, etc. You have now had a chance to go back and listen to how things were, especially oh, yeah. when when you were in a temporary situation, compared to where you're at now. And maybe you should talk a little bit about the distance between those two well, and your impression. Well, I think, first of all, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's when I was working temporarily compared to now in my in my permanent studio, which, you know, is the, the fortress of <laughs> of all things good audio, the beast. Um, the beast. It makes a difference. I'll tell you, it, you know, in my auditions and first impressions. In, you know, submitting files to my clients where they literally don't have to do any work. I mean, they don't even have to think about it. And and sometimes it's like it almost a it's almost like a you, you can't put your finger on it. But you know what? Her audio just sounds amazing. So, yeah, she's a pro- it, it, it says so much in the very first impression that people have of you or even, you know, a, as you keep upping your game. Um, yeah, this girl's a professional. She's serious about her business. Um, her sound just keeps getting better and better. And it just it just eludes like professional. And I right. think that and that's first set- impressions are yeah, everything. right? Exactly. Yeah. First impressions okay. are everything. So yeah. so what about the performance factor? How much more comfortable have you been? I mean, I look, I know that you've been a pro at the top of your game for a long time, but I would like to talk a little bit about the psychology of oh my gosh. how it is. Yeah. How do feeling you feel good, you're performing? Feeling confident. And, and I just actually, before we even, you know, started recording this podcast, Tim, I said, Hey, have I told you lately how much I love the studio? Like literally you did say that. I can, I can come in here 
um, feeling confident. You know, I've got distractions and noises happening outside my booth. And literally, I can just come in here and it's like, ah, uh, it's like a little bit of Zen. And I can just, you know, the outside world dissolves <laughs> and I can just come in here and be who I need to be and perform the way I need to perform with the ultimate confidence that my audio is going to sound great. And I'm not I'm not going to have to spend hours, you know, cleaning up my uh, my my sound in post. It just, it makes a huge difference. It's literally, I walk in here and it's like, ah, oh, I know my audio is going to be good. And I yeah, know and that, yeah. And, and I know that my client is going to think that my audio is good. Yeah. And we hear about this in the forums all the time about how much people are offering per finished hour. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of people are saying, well, that's a ridiculous price. or that's a good price. Well, the price is going to vary or your perception of the price is going to vary depending on how long it takes you to edit your audiobook, mm -hmm. right? And let's say you're even sending your audiobooks out to have someone else edit them, which a lot of audiobook narrators actually do, do. Mm -hmm. okay? How much is that person going to charge you relative to how much work they have to do to right. clean up your audiobook, right? right? So- when it comes to audiobooks, it's very much the same as it would be for medical narration, for e-learning, et cetera. And I could give you a really good example of what I mean. Do you feel, and I don't know how much you audition, okay? I know how much a lot of other people audition. Oh, yeah. And yeah. when we improve their situation, they're able to audition many, many times more oh, yeah. than they otherwise were able to because now their audio is at a standard where cleanup is just an absolute breeze. Oh yeah. The, yeah. The, the only thing stopping, the only thing stopping you from doing more auditions is your own perception of your performance. Right. And that, you know, that, that's all another podcast, right? That's where get, you know, get a great coach. Right. Um, right. and be calm. But, but I think that the whole audio, if you take that out of the picture, having to worry about that audio sounding good, it, first of all, it ups your, your confidence level before you even begin that audition, which is huge. I mean, it, it affects your performance in many positive ways yeah it really does because it's it's interesting how it is that they have this terminology that they use in golf you know if i could just take my range game to the course mm -hmm. right where i'm where i'm practicing etc something happens to us mentally when we hit that record button mm -hmm. right? yep <laughs> everything's fine and then you hit the record button and just <laughs> it, it all falls apart and then right? you perform and then it's like you perform behind the mic and sometimes that's not what you want you just want it to be natural and effortless yeah you just want to turn it on and go yep. right and that's the idea here so anyway my point is if you are either consciously or subconsciously wondering whether or not you sound good you are hosing yourself right you can't be in a situation where the audio tech is not tight mm -hmm. and you cannot be in a, situ in a situation where the acoustics are bad or, you know, there's some sort of hum on the line, which is another episode that we talked about. Yep. These all come together. But the reason I wanted to talk about audiobooks is because there has been so much confusion about it and so many questions being asked about it because we have tons of people who are coming into the audiobook world every single day. Like yeah, it's a absolutely. flood. It's an absolute flood. So then you're recommending number one, and we talked about um, RMS and we talked about tips on getting your audio to the specs that is required by either ACX or, you know, whoever you're. Well, I guess if you have a different publishing company, they have their own set of specs, right? Or are they all pretty much the same? No, I mean, they're all pretty much the mm -hmm. same from what I can tell. Yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, bo bottom line is, is you, you, the reason that it's important to really understand when it comes to audiobooks is because these newer people that we have coming in, I'm hearing that they're recording at minus 22, which is something that we talked about yeah, before. Yep. Right. Yep. They're recording at minus 22 because that lowers their noise floor. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> you now have a, a low noise floor, a, a pretend low noise floor. And now you go to normalize all of everything is being averaged with right. RMS. So now right. that that noise, noise floor. floor is now going to be super loud. Mm -hmm. And then you have to take that and normalize that to minus three. Right now, the reason that that's really, really tough, and I've seen this happen many times, 
is because it's not like the stuff that you and I do. A lot of the stuff that you and I do is in and out, right? I'm an in and out kind of guy. <laughs> I don't do audiobooks. I did a 40K project once just to get through the marathon so that I could speak to it. And, and boy, you know, even, even though it was, it was for this uh, thing in Louisiana, because to be a bouncer, you have to be licensed. And I had to read this big, long technical thing. And so I would definitely ace the test. There's no question about that. But I do understand what it's like to put in that much work. And if I had to go back after the fact, because everything was ruined by my misunderstanding of how to handle my audio, and I've seen this happen, I cannot imagine the mental anguish that mm -hmm. that would put on me. Well, it yeah, would be insane. I think that that's another point to talk about that's important with audiobooks and, and audio and processing audio is that a lot of times uh, narrators are in that studio for a long time recording. And so if you don't have your proper setup, um, if you you don't have confidence in the fact that your audio is coming out pristine um, and you've already put in a good hour... <laughs> Of, yeah. of recording, oh my gosh, that would just not be good. Now, an I, hour, an yeah. hour, that would be like the shortest book ever. Yeah, well, but I mean, at a time. Right? I'm talking before you have to get oh, out yeah, and like, at take a, time. a break, well, I, that sort of thing. I, so I know some people who will stay in the booth at, for three or four hours at yeah, a time. Absolutely. You know, so, and that yeah, session, it, yeah, and that session, it's funny because I always tell my students uh, when they're recording, I homework for me because it's not a, it's not an audiobook but I'm like look I want you to record a little bit each day because you never know like your performance changes from day to day right are you tired are you stressed is it the mm -hmm. morning is it the afternoon is it the evening you're going to have different performance issues let's put it that way if you have issues or performance uh, considerations uh, yep. at each time of the day and it's better if you can to record a little bit each day rather than to spend all of it at once you know the night before yep. doing your homework which I think when you're doing audiobooks, a lot of times you do spend a lot of time in the booth, right? All day in the booth. And so if there's something misaligned, right? Or if you're speaking from back here for, you know, a good hour or two, or maybe for the whole day, you know, that I think that that would be something yeah, that, that you wouldn't want to have to go back and redo. Yeah, That's and a I'm, lot and of your time. We, I'm glad that we were, were able to make that, uh, that comparison there with both of our booths. Okay. Because mm -hmm. even though I'm in my control room, I mean, it's not as tight as my booth is, but even in your booth, which is a super, super tight booth mm -hmm. acoustically, we can still hear yeah. that you're too far away from the mic. Absolutely. Right? So I'm glad Absolutely. that you did that. And and we'll make sure that that gets normalized uh, during the episode <laughs> yeah. so people can, That's right. can hear you can back hear off of it. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm I'm going to be putting together, I'm not sure if I'm going to release it on my YouTube VO Tech Guru channel or what it is that I'm going to do. I'll release it somewhere. So, um, But what I am going to do is I'm going to run audio it'll will probably be in video format but people will definitely be able to hear it i'm going to be running audio through this external plugin that we talked about okay again i'm not going to name it and then i'm going to probably have an example of Great. doing just heavy rms inside the daw you know i'll just use like uh, audacity or something like that and then i'll give an example of doing it responsibly perfect and and then i'll have that normalized to minus three and then people can make up their own mind as far as what sounds best perfect good stuff good information tim all right, guys, I'm going to give a great big shout out to our sponsor, IPDTL. You too can connect and communicate and talk like a boss and find out more at IPDTL.com. You guys have a great week and we'll see you next week. Bye. See you guys. Join us next week for another edition of VO Boss with your host and Ganguza. And take your business to the next level. Sign up for our mailing list at VOBoss.com and receive exclusive content, industry revolutionizing tips and strategies and new ways to rock your business like a boss. Redistribution with permission. Coast to coast connectivity via IPDTL.